Welcome to Legends of Tabletop. You're listening to myself, Leah Bond, and also Derek Hussey of Hippocampus Press. How are you doing today, Derek? Oh, very well. Thanks, Leah. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Tell, tell me what's going on over at Hippocampus Press. Well, we're just coming out of one of our trademark bottlenecks where we have a lot of books that have been coming out for a long time, and now they're going to hit the shelves pretty much all at once. Uh, mostly H.P. Lovecraft. Hippocampus Press, of course, is devoted to the works of H.P. Lovecraft and has been since we started. And we're just going to continue doing that. We have a book now coming out called The Annotated Fungi from Yagas, which has been greatly anticipated. David E. Schultz has been working on it for up to 40 years, I think close to 40 years. So, on and off, not the whole time. Uh, I think I lost your sound there. I don't know if that's... I, I'm trying to remain fairly silent. Okay. Uh, which is a really fun thing. Uh, he's been working on it on and off for about 40, 30 to 40 years, I would say. Uh, really put in an incredible amount of annotations, uh, analysis, commentary, and we also have illustrations from Jason Eckhart. He's done 40 original illustrations for this book. Oh, wow. One for each poem. There's, it's a series of 36 sonnets that Lovecraft wrote. Uh, wrote them over just a, less than a month. He wrote them all. And uh, Schultz has come up with an incredible analysis of these poems, really sort of reveals them to be like the distillation of Lovecraft's aesthetic thought and all of his creative output. Uh, it's sort of like a Rosetta Stone for Lovecraft's writing. And it should be a brilliant addition. I, I certainly wouldn't mind having that to grace my own bookshelf. And I know a couple of Lovecraftian enthusiasts that would love to see that on theirs as well. Well, it's going to be really nice. We're doing it in a limited edition, 300 copies, uh, mm -hmm. my own signatures, and in green ink. This was a, something we decided to do since it's fungus, it's fungi. Uh, we're going to have nice dark green ink on natural colored paper, and it should be very nice. It should be beautiful. Wow. Um, are there any other uh, new releases that we need to keep an eye out on? Well, we're up for doing Variorum 4, which is a collection of Lovecraft's uh, revisions and collaborations. We did the first three volumes uh, in 2015, which were the science stories. These are Lovecraft's own stories that uh, he's best known for. And it's an edition edited by S.T. Joshi that contains all the textual variants so that if because Lovecraft revised his stories as he went through. You know, sometimes they would write it one way on the manuscript, and it would appear a different way slightly in the magazine and then the first book appearance. And so gradually, as the stories evolved, there were different revisions made. And our edition presents all the different textual variants laid out as footnotes, so you can really see what differences there are between the different editions. Uh, and as I said, we did the first three volumes in hardcover in 2015. And the fourth volume, which is all of his collaborations, well, it's not all of them, but it is his collaborations and revisions. Uh, we are putting that out in uh, 2017, we're probably January, uh, as a paperback only. Oh, wow. So the, the collaborations, that would be work that he has done also with Durleth and, oh gosh, which one was it? Uh, Lost in the Halls of Eric's? Uh, well, I don't know that there's anything with Derleth in it. Those, uh, those posthumous collaborations are not going to be included. Uh, <laughs> those were done after Lovecraft was, uh, was safely buried. But we do have the revisions that he did. He did a lot of ghostwriting you know, in his <laughs> life to make money. And so we have stories from Zelia Brown Reed and, uh, oh, I don't know, a bunch of different authors. I don't have the, the table of contents right in front of me. Let's see. Uh, so you have you, you mentioned uh, S.T. Joshi, and you have been working with him off and on since the mid '90s. It's true. It's true. I met S.T. in 1995. Uh, I was working at the time at an academic publisher, Routledge, in Midtown Manhattan, and uh, I was collecting some Lovecraft material. You know, I've been a Lovecraft fan since I was in my teens, as most people seem to come to Lovecraft at that age. Yes. Uh, 
And a book dealer in New York City was selling a letter of Lovecraft's to Clark Ashton Smith. And I had always wanted to get a Lovecraft autograph or something written by him. And I was eager to purchase this, but I thought in those days someone might counterfeit such a document. I didn't realize how hard it would actually be to counterfeit a real Lovecraft letter. So I asked around on the internet on uh, Usenet, Old Horror Cthulhu, uh, where I could get something like that authenticated. And pretty soon I got a response back from none other than David E. Schultz, who uh, I've also gone on to work with. Uh, He and ST have collaborated on a lot of projects. And uh, David said that the world's leading Lovecraft scholar, and he may have put it in quotes, uh, (laughs) lived in in my town in New York City and that I should drop him a line, gave me the email address. And so I did, we met for lunch. And as he was, I showed him a photocopy of the letter in question, and he was uh, he was 100% certain that it was authentic. And in fact, he said that he didn't think he had ever seen it before, and that he would like to get a copy of it for, well, at the time was a proposed online database of all the Lovecraft letters. Oh, wow. Well. Which he was assembling with Donovan Laux of hblovecraft.com. And uh, pretty soon after that, you know, we kept in touch. Uh, he had asked me some questions at uh, this initial lunchtime meeting, which might have been sort of like you know, sort of like a job interview. He asked me what else I like to read besides Lovecraft, and yes. I had mentioned Blackwood and Dunsany and M. R. James, and so I think I passed the audition. I said, <laughs> and we had we had shared interests, and uh, pretty soon after that, he put me to work as a volunteer typist, typing up these Lovecraft letters that had not been published. Uh, that was about 1996. Oh, wow. Uh, and, we, you know, we kept in touch. Uh, 1997, I attended my first Necronomicon convention in Providence, mm-hmm. which in those days was hosted by Necronomicon Press, Mark Michaud. And, of course, I was a big fan of all of his work and have any number of their publications in my library here. Um, attended 97. And after that point, ST said that if I wanted to start my own press, that he would provide me with my first book. Uh, Indeed, he's provided me with an endless stream, seemingly endless stream of worthwhile projects. Um, And so by 1999, uh, I had set up Hippocampus Press. I attended Necronomicon in 99. Mm -hmm. I did not have any books out yet. Uh, But in 2001, which was the last Necronomicon for a long time, the last one run by Necronomicon Press, I went as a vendor. And uh, I had released two books at that point. The, uh, our first one, which was the annotated supernatural horror in literature. That's Lovecraft's monograph on the history of, uh, of horror literature with yeah. notes by ST. And also the corrected text of The Shadow of Time. Also with notes. And actually, that was our first stab at a variorum edition because it presented a list of all the errata that had accrued in various editions of that because the uh, the TypeScript finally surfaced and ST was able to go through and make a list of over a thousand errors that had been perpetuated in all the different editions, able to correct all those. So that was, uh, that sort of set the stage for what we've done ever since. Wow, and I believe it was a, somehow or another, I got my hands on a copy of that and that was my introduction to ST. Well, that's a good introduction. It shows, you know, him at his best, I think, really, is uh, bringing Lovecraft back to its essence, back to Lovecraft's own writing, the way he originally intended it. Uh, Because, frankly, the stories have suffered a lot of different editors through the years who have not been that concerned with textual accuracy. Uh, They have not been that concerned with preserving Lovecraft's idiosyncratic spellings or hyphenation or punctuation, paragraphing. Pretty much a lot of times they just had to make it fit into whatever magazine or book they were issuing. But ST has been devoted to going back to the original sources, uh, manuscripts, typescripts, early appearances in order to get the stories the way Lovecraft intended them. And... uh, that's always been something I've wanted to, you know, I wanted to read them the way they were intended to be read. Yeah. Of course, who wouldn't? Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> oh. Well, it's funny, actually, ST has taken some flack for his editorial decisions. Uh, some people have read the corrected texts of Lovecraft fiction that ST prepared for Arkham House. Of course, Arkham House is the main 
publisher has been for many years of Lovecraft uh, since 1939 when they put out The Outsider. Um, but in the 80s, ST worked with them to derive some corrected texts of the, uh, the signature stories. And a lot of people took exception to some of his editorial choices. They said, well, it's not that way in my Valentine paperback, or it's not that way in my Lancer paperback, or my copy of Weird Tales. Why did you change it like this? And well, frankly, the Variorum edition that I mentioned earlier, that's sort of a response to that, because now you'll be able to see exactly why ST has made the editorial choices he has, and mm -hmm. why certain words have been rendered differently than they were in a lot of mass market editions. Uh, and you know, the other, the other variants are right there on the bottom of the page. So if you don't like it, and you want to read it the way it was in the Ballantine book, for instance, perhaps it's there, you can read it that way. Yep. <laughs> And, th and that was one of the things that I really appreciated about it, so that it was extremely thorough. It was so thorough. Um, um, yeah, we have 10,000 footnotes across three volumes in the very one. Yes. This is, this is the very, I'll hold it up for you. This is volume one of the very warm edition. Uh, we put it out in hardcover. We're just now preparing a paperback edition of that to come out in 2017. It'll be time to the release of the fourth volume that I mentioned, the revisions and collaborations, which is long delayed, but we will put them all four of them out in paperback. And there are, in fact, a couple of new variants for the paperback editions that we've discovered. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm just looking for this timeline here. Uh, that I, let's see. Uh, you then, after meeting up with ST, uh, you then joined the Esoteric Order of Dagon. That is true, an amateur yes. press association. Uh, Lovecraft himself was a member of the amateur press movement, and that was instrumental in getting him sort of out of his shell. Uh, he had been something of a uh, stay-at-home, he had been Providence, but uh, being introduced to the amateur journalism movement allowed him to make contact with a lot of people, not so much in person at first, but through the mail. Uh, printing up his own little magazine, which was called The Conservative, mm -hmm. and circulating it, and receiving other people's magazines back and commenting on them. Uh, the amateur journalism movement was intended to develop writers, professional writers, out of amateur writers, mm -hmm. primarily. And so they would submit their works for criticism by the other authors. And frankly, Lovecraft is probably the best example of a success story from the whole amateur journalism movement. Uh, to, well, together with the theater critic Brooks Atkinson, they both came out of the AJ or amateur journalism movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was helpful to Lovecraft, and you know, it was helpful to me also because once I got into publishing these little magazines, uh, my you know, I, had, I made a fanzine, and the name of my fanzine was the Amethystine Hippocampus. Oh, somewhat psychedelic name. Yeah, uh, but it actually derives from the master. That was one of Lovecraft's pet names for his best friend, Frank Belknap Long. He called him Little Amethystine Hippocampus, uh, Petit Hippocampus, stuff like that. Uh, don't really know why. Little Purple Brain. It's, uh, yeah. it's characteristically florid, purple prose, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's exactly where I went with the Amethystine. Yeah. <laughs> So having done that for a number of years, when it came time to pick a name for the new publishing company, I selected Hippocampus Press. And actually, we had one publication before we were Hippocampus Press, which was a facsimile edition of Frank Long's Goblin Tower, some unbound sheets. And that came out under the, uh, under the imprint of Amethystine Hippocampus House. Oh, well. Which that's, uh, that's a great rarity. I don't know anybody who has a copy of that that wasn't in the EOD at that time, but that was just a mimeograph or, or a photocopied stapled together thing, but that was our sort of a proto publication. Okay. Let's see. Oh, yes. And then, and then, and then my notes go to, and then your website lists the number of publications and websites for your podcasts that are no longer there. <laughs> Well, it's true. I did an interview with Destiny's Radio, and uh, I did an interview with jogsasas.com, uh, which is a great site. And I'm, I've only just learned today that those are not available online. I have I have them archived, uh, but I guess they're not up there. Perhaps I should put them up online for people, for my fans. Yes. Please. <laughs> 
Oh man. Um, but but yeah. Uh, let's see. You also mentioned. Oh wait, no. In in 2014, you also got a shout out in Publishers Weekly. That is true. That is true. Uh, we had at that point we had issued another of our series of the collected letters of H.P. Lovecraft. This is an ongoing project. Our goal is to publish all of Lovecraft's letters in annotated editions. And we had just put out one of Lovecraft's letters to uh, Toldridge and uh, to Anne Tillery Renshaw, Elizabeth Toldridge and Anne Tillery Renshaw, two ladies that he corresponded with. And anyway, uh, Publishers Weekly noted at the time that we were the world's leading publisher of books related to H.P. Lovecraft, which was uh, quite a thrill, great honor. And uh, yeah. I mean, absolutely, Publishers Weekly, hey. That's right. Well, that's largely because the other two main publishers of Lovecraftiana have largely gone dormant, which, of course, Arkham House uh, has not released any books in a long time, unfortunately. And Necronomicon Press, which is getting back into action. I think, In fact, I think both of those guys are getting back into action, which I think is wonderful. I certainly never wanted to take their place. I'm a big fan of both of those presses and have many, many of both of their publications. And I've always said that I think that the field is big enough for all three of us and really, you know, lots of people to operate. Uh, and I think that we've seen in recent years, we've seen so much, such a boom in the mythos writing, uh, which is stories that take place in Lovecraft's universe. Mm -hmm. There has been an incredible bubble. We don't do a lot of that. We do some. Uh, we're more dedicated now to, uh, to primary sources, actual writings by Lovecraft and his circle. Uh, although we have done a fair amount, I guess, of mythos writing through the years, and we will continue to do some original fiction. I uh, mean, well, can you really blame anyone? Those are, that's an awful fun little set of toys to play with in the sandbox. It is, it is. Lovecraft has left us the whole universe, and of course he encouraged that. He encouraged other people to uh, to continue his work. And people people certainly do seem to, I don't know how much longer it can go. The bubble just keeps seeming to grow and grow and grow, with more anthologies being released every year. Um, I saw recently that one of the main uh, critics of this stuff, Matthew Carpenter, has uh, posted that he is no longer able to read everything that is published in the Mythos field. And that is a, that's a great shock. He's sort of like the John Donne of Mythos writing, who has read everything published up to a certain point. And for him to say he can no longer keep up, that just shows you just how big the, uh, the field has gotten. Yeah. Wonderful times. That's true. Good time to be a Lovecraft. Yes, indeed. Because it's like every time I, I remember saying every time that I find something new to read, it, it's just fantastic because there is just a deluge of new content. It, it won't get stale, you know, that way. It, it seems to me that it, that it won't, at least not for a long time. Not for a while, not for a while. And I guess that there's a lot of uh, new content for gaming also. It keeps coming out new modules for the uh, Call of Cthulhu and other uh, live action role playing games. You know, I was a, I was a uh, Dungeon Dragons player when I was in boarding school, prep school. And through that, I was introduced to Call of Cthulhu and about 1982, 83 and uh, enjoyed it. I like to play it. And but I think the great benefit was that the rule book that came with the CFC had a mention of Arkham House. So I, you know, as having published the best editions up to that point of Lovecraft, and I rode off to Sauk City and got the catalog. And next thing you know, I was on my way. <laughs> yeah. That's actually what introduced me to Lovecraft in general was, uh, I was at a role playing convention and a gentleman needed people to fill his, uh, his game session. And I figured, you know what, why not? And and I was hooked from that point on. It's like, who is this guy? What is this all about? So, yeah. Yep, you got the bug. Yep. <laughs> but uh, not only are you involved with Hippocampus, you had mentioned something about nonprofit charitable work. 
It is true. It is true. Uh, well, in addition to being the proprietor of Hippocampus Press, I'm a trustee of the Aeroflex Foundation, which is a grant making nonprofit in Manhattan. And in recent years, I've been directing some of our attention to the authors that I love and care about. Uh, the names will not surprise you H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard. Um, this all came about because of directly as a result of my attendance at Necronomicon in the 1990s, mm -hmm. uh, where I saw the Lovecraft plaque that was placed at the John Hay Library. Mm -hmm. And there was a little booklet about the centennial plaque that Necronomicon Press had issued. And reading that booklet, I discovered that in order for the fans to donate the money to put up this plaque in front of the library, the university had to establish a fund called the H.P. Lovecraft Restoration and Acquisition Fund to receive the donations for the plaque. And that's what they did. They took the money that was donated, put it, put it in this fund, and then spent it on the plaque. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out that the fund was still active. It had just been at a zero balance since the plaque came up. And I said, well, what if we donate some more money to this fund? Will they do something else with it? And in fact, they now use it for its intended purpose, which is Lovecraft Restoration and Acquisition. Brown University, which is the main repository of all Lovecraft's papers, has become an aggressive uh, acquirer of manuscript material that comes on the market with our help. Excellent. And, yeah. And? And, and? Well, and also in, let's see, I think in 2013, we unveiled the S.T. Joshi Endowed Research Fellowship for H.P. Lovecraft at the John Hay Library. This is a fellowship which will actually pay some lucky scholar to study Lovecraft at the Hay Library. Um, it gives a stipend, uh, sometimes up to two stipends a year. They, they, uh, they've done pretty well with the fund. and. Mm -hmm. What they do is they, they give the scholar a certain amount of money to come to Providence, use the resources of the John Hay Library, and to, towards their purpose of, uh, of studying Lovecraft, and they will give a talk, a public talk, and publish their findings. Largely, hopefully, we publish their findings in the Lovecraft Annual. Um, and it worked, it worked out so well. In fact, they just had a new uh, fellow, Matthew Beach, was just at the Hay Library giving a talk uh, he's the latest Joshi fellow up there, and that's just been doing very well. We've actually followed suit with a Clark Ashton Smith Research Fellowship at the Bancroft Library in California. Oh, that's great. The Bancroft Library at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. That's where all of Clark Ashton Smith's papers are. That one is still being funded, and we expect it will reach inception levels this year, well, in 2017, next year. Uh, that one is named for Donald Sidney Fryer, who is one of the earliest and still the best Clark Ashton Smith proponent uh, and a poet himself. Uh, so that is going to come into, into inception in 2017. And the most recent one is dedicated to Robert E. Howard. Uh, at the Ransom Center at University of Texas at Austin, we have established an endowed research fellowship for the study of Robert E. Howard and his circle. They have all the papers of Howard down there. Um, Robert E. Howard, of course, was the creator of Conan the Sumerian, popularly known as Conan the Barbarian, and King Cull and Solomon Kane, a lot of other characters that have really been very popular. And they have, in recent years, at the Ransom, Ransom Center, they've acquired an enormous archive of Howard's papers, probably in excess of 15,000 pages. Uh, that stuff needs to be studied. And yes, now. Now people will be able to do it uh, on the university's dime because of the, uh, the the research fellowship. So that's that's been a big excitement, exciting project for me to get involved with these things. I can understand why that is so so very very cool. I had I had no idea that these things existed. Well, a lot of you know a lot of people don't know about it. We we don't get a lot of publicity for it. I mean, Brown University has been pretty good about publicizing the. Well, they had a little party for the inception in 2013. They had a little reception at the Rockefeller Library, and every year they do publicize it on their blogs. But it's not widely known. Uh, so far, there's been no publicity from the Bancroft or from uh, from University of Texas at Austin Ranson Center because they're not. You know, it's not at inception levels yet, but hopefully they will make some announcements. 
I think part of it is because these are not done through crowdfunding. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't get the you know groundswell of enthusiasm that a lot of people do uh, when everybody's chipping in. This is something that's just sort of done uh, outside of that realm. Uh, I'm hoping, though, that we can bring that in, at least with the Robert E. Howard one. I noticed that uh, the, the Howard scholars, uh, Rusty Burke in particular, has uh, expressed an interest in conducting a kind of fundraising to add additional funds to the research fellowship for Howard. And I think that would be a good way to get the news out through Howard fandom. Mm -hmm. And actually, they, they could actually chip in. Of course, that could be done at any of these institutions. You're more than welcome to send in donations. But how we can publicize that is something that's a challenge that we're going to face coming up. So, uh, so in order to uh, publicize the donation to these things, um, other of course, talking about it on here, if anyone wanted to donate to these, how would the average person do so? Well, it's my understanding they would just contact the library where the fellowships are held. Uh, in the case of Clark Ashton Smith, it's the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley. And we'll be making a big announcement at the upcoming Necronomicon 2017 about this, because as I said, that one and the Howard Fellowship, both of these are reaching uh, inception levels in 2017. And in Providence, this, this coming year, Donald Sidney Fryer will be a guest of honor. In fact, I believe he is the poet laureate of this coming Necronomicon, and the Clark Ashton Smith Fellowship has been named in his honor. So we will uh, we'll be making some sort of announcement there with more information. That's fantastic. Um, is there is there anything else that you'd like to share with the community at large? Well, I just think that Lovecraft has grown incredibly in popularity. His profile has gotten a lot sharper. And as a result, we see him a lot more clearly than we had in the past. And that is not without its drawbacks, certainly. Lovecraft has taken sort of a, sort of a beating in the PR department in recent years. Uh, but I think that what's important for Lovecraft fans to know is that certainly you're part of an enormous movement of people who like this sort of thing. And Lovecraft is for the ages. Lovecraft is to be studied. You know, he's not someone to put up on a pedestal. And he's not someone to revile. Uh, we should study him. He's a historical figure. He's a literary figure. And uh, a fascinating one at that. It seems to be, his work seems to be an almost bottomless reservoir of material and inspiration for people. And there's something there. There's absolutely something there. And as long as I can, I will continue to uh, to publish books that are of Lovecraft in merit with Lovecraft readers and fans in mind. These are books that I would like to read, but that don't exist. So I have to publish them. That's exactly my motto. OK. Um, are, are there any upcoming publications uh, from other authors in general? that are coming out under your imprint that we need to be aware of? In fact, there are. In fact, there are. We have uh, a poetry line, which we do weird poetry, which is a genre, sub subgenre of uh, speculative poetry, which we have done any number of books in the past. And coming up, we have a collection from Mike Fantina. Michael Fantina is called The Alchemy of Dreams. That will be a single poet collection. Following that, there will be one by Adam Bolivar called The Lay of Old Hex, which contains all of his macabre ballads, uh, all sort of intertwined together. And just recently, we have signed Ashley Diasis. Her book will be called Confessions of a Sorceress. Oh, mm -hmm. excuse me, Diary of a Sorceress. And uh, sorry, Ashley, I blew it. But <laughs> Diary of a Sorceress. And that, that we're really looking forward to that. Uh, as far as fiction, we have a few titles coming up. Uh, just recently signed a contract with Jonathan Thomas, who we've put out five of his, uh, four of his books already. This will be the fifth. And this is a collection of some of his stories that have appeared in various anthologies and some new material. 
And the title of that, it's a long title. It's called The Naked Revenants and Other Fables of Old and New England. Uh, you know, some of these stories are set in Providence. Uh, several of them are either overtly or covertly Lovecraftian in nature. And we're going to get that out hopefully in the spring or early summer. There's to be a book release party at the Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Council in Providence, which is Niels Hobbs' endeavor up there, a wonderful place. And we're looking forward to having a book release party there. Um, Jeffrey Thomas, who is well known for his punk town world. We have a book coming out from him called Haunted Worlds. And that is pretty much all unpublished material, unpublished stories from Jeffrey, mm -hmm. uh, including two punk town stories. Excellent. Um, and the most recent one that we have signed up is one from Stephen Woodworth. Now, Stephen is a uh, New York Times bestselling author for his uh, Violet Eyes series that came out from Dell. And we're very excited to have him joining the Hippocampus Library with A Carnival of Chimeras. Ooh. Now, this is not exclusively Lovecraftian, but it does have a number of, again, both explicitly and indirectly Lovecraftian tales, uh, some of which have been published by S.T. Joshi in his various anthologies. So, although I, we are focus mostly on primary sources, we do maintain an original fiction line, and we'll continue to do so. Excellent. Now, uh, oh gosh, let's see, you've, you've got an exciting year coming up. It's, it's true, it's true. One other thing I should mention is in addition to the Lovecraft letters, we, I mean, we have three Lovecraft letters volumes coming out in 2017, which will be Lovecraft's letters to Clark Ashton Smith, we have both sides of the correspondence there, so it's sort of like a literary uh, conversation with the two authors talking back and forth. We have Lovecraft letters to C.L. Moore, Henry Kuttner, and Fritz Leiber mm -hmm. uh, coming out in May, and uh, the letters to Maurice Moe, who was one of Lovecraft's closest friends. That should be coming out in August. And additionally, we're launching a new series of the letters of Clark Ashton Smith. Uh, Arkham House did a selected letters of Clark Ashton Smith, but we will be going correspondent by correspondent in the same way we did with Lovecraft, same way we do with Lovecraft's letters. And we'll be publishing the Smith letters to August Derleth, which are really fascinating, all about the founding of Arkham House and so forth. Smith letters to Barlow. You know, uh, Robert H. Barlow was a young fan of Lovecraft's who became his literary executor. And uh, he and Smith started out on very good terms, and the relationship deteriorated uh, and ended quite acrimoniously. And so that will make some fascinating reading. Yeah. Smith, Smith letters to Donald Wandry. Of course, uh, Clark Ashton Smith was the one who introduced Donald Wandry to H.P. Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wandry and Derlis later went on to found Arkham House. Yes. And one I'm particularly looking forward to is the Smith letters to Samuel Loveman. Uh, Loveman was an uh, associate of Lovecraft, but an associate of Smith's long before he came in touch with Lovecraft. And he's someone that we, we published Sam Loveman's collected uh, or a sele selection of his poetry and nonfiction and fiction called uh, Out of the Immortal Night a uh, number of years ago. Uh, Loveman has not really got his due yet, I don't think. And uh, he is largely known as a literary hanger on which I think is sort of belittling to him. And he was acquainted with a great number of people in various fields of literature. He knew Bierce, he knew uh, Vincent Starrett, he knew uh, Hart Crane, as well as Smith and Lovecraft, uh, George Kirk. Uh, so most recently, I've actually it's always been an aspiration of mine to learn more about Samuel Loveman. And in fact, we are gonna have a biography of Samuel Loveman which I've just commissioned from David Goodsword, who did our Lovecraft in the Merrimack Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, David is working on H.P. Lovecraft in Florida for us, which is going to hopefully be out for Necronomicon 2017. And after Lovecraft in Florida is complete, we're going to be doing working together on the Samuel Loveman biography, which I believe will also include David's projected Lovecraft in Cleveland. So that's going to be a fascinating one for 
all the diehards out there who really would like to know about Lovecraft's travels and also know more about Samuel Lovemer. I think that's going to be that's, that's a hippocampus press book for for uh, for sure because it's just <laughs> so specialized and dedicated to uh, to the stuff that that we are uh, known for. Absolutely. Now, I. Uh... How long and what, well, no, I, I'm, my next question is going to be, what is your favorite part of the process of, of publishing a book under your imprint? Do you take part in the editing proofreading process? I, I can understand you taking part in the entire thing, um, but, but what is your part specifically? Well, traditionally, uh, what I've done is assemble the manuscript together with cover art, and I do the final proof and arrange for it to be printed and distributed and marketed. But in recent years, actually, I've taken a more intensive role, uh, starting with the uh, well, starting with the Variorum edition, which really became almost like an obsession for me. I went through and checked the texts, so I was actually helping St with all of those 10,000 footnotes that I mentioned and going line by line with different, I've, you know, I've assembled a library of early appearances here. I have Arkham House books, I have amateur journals, uh, I have a whole stack of the tryout here. So we've been going through line by line and checking the texts and that was something new. I was able to find a number of things which had eluded ST and some of which actually wound up changing the uh, the readings of certain significant passages in Lovecraft's own stories. So working at that level with these texts has been a great thrill. Uh, and I've just I've found that working in, in intensively with Lovecraft's own writings, I've found that it's different from when I read him the first time and when I've read him for pleasure. I've found that he is both a far better and a far worse writer than I remembered. Uh -huh. uh, Fascinating. Uh, some things that were not immediately apparent to me, uh, reading for pleasure, came out more. And other things that I sort of, I guess I liked them more when I was a kid, uh, I'm sort of like, well, you know, that's a little clunky now when you read these things. And of course, our, our developing sensitivities uh, have, uh, are, have evolved. And some things are a little awkward, without question. But then again, the man was writing 100 years ago. So what can you do? <laughs> That's, so that's, probably, that's the most fun. That's the most intensive stuff, I would say. Uh, but receiving that first box of books from the printer and opening them up is always a little bit hair raising, I'll say, because somehow typos get through and what's not apparent on the screen will jump right out off of paper. And I'm always afraid when I open up one of these books, somebody's going to jump out and be like, oh, oh, no, how did we miss that? And it's happened. It happens a lot. Uh, I think a book, I think Lovecraft himself said that a book without any typographical errors is that most elusive and rare of literary creations, something like that. <laughs> yeah, and that, and that was going to lead through to the next one, which is what is the absolute worst part? But we'll go ahead and, and go past that. Uh, let's see. Um, if I, anyone wants to know about the very worst part, I would direct them to a uh, recent Lovecraft e-zine uh, no. <laughs> segment. That's got to be the absolute nadir of my publishing experience. Uh, I won't say anything more about it. I, I, I apologize for, for that. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, <sighs> Is there anything coming up that's outside of the hippocampus arena that you are really excited for? What are you looking forward to? Well, I, the Necronomicon 2017, which I'm also looking forward to. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's looming large. Uh, but between now and then, I have a personal milestone coming up. Uh, which is a birthday. It happens every year about this time. And this is one of the uh, significant ones. It's a round number. Oh. Uh, I'll be turning 50 in January. Well, happy upcoming birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm getting out of town. Uh, so I will, okay. be I will be celebrating my birthday somewhere in the North Atlantic on a transatlantic voyage. 
we're taking, Anastasia and I are going to take the Queen Mary 2, uh, departs out of uh, Brooklyn, and I'll be somewhere at sea. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Very cool. Oh my goodness. Uh, let's let's go ahead and jump into the final five just for right now. Uh, we call we call it the final five. It may be a final five. It may not be a final five. Um, video game or tabletop? Gaming. Oh, tabletop for sure. And it why would that be? Because the new video games, I mean, well, if I had, if, if I could play my old Atari 2600, I think I would take that. But it's very difficult to get those things hooked up to these new flat screen televisions, and I'm not even sure I could do it. Uh, I still have my Atari, and, uh, but as far as just sheer portability and interactiveness, I think tabletop gaming is the way to go. Yes. I mean, I'm going to have to agree with you on that one. And here's one that I've had to edit over the past couple of interviews. Uh, let's see, just for sheer literacy sake, um, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Doom? Which one and why? Well, I'll take Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Star Trek for 400, Lynn. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the reason being that it has a more humanistic vibe to it, I think. A little bit more relatable to me, uh, and optimistic in the sense that it looks forward to a better time when science has resolved a lot of the pressing issues which seem to be, you know, oppressing us now in the current day. And we've gone on to better things, and we're out there exploring the universe. Star Wars is a fable, and you know, conveniently said in a galaxy far far away so it's not really us but of course it is um i don't i don't know I, I haven't kept up with the new star wars stuff so i don't really know what the uh you know what the the canon contains now i enjoyed those movies when they came out but it doesn't hasn't appealed to me the way star trek does and dune i will say i am not a great fan of either the movies or the novels it just not, never got me Now, Derek, if you could have one superpower, what would it be in one? Well, uh, precognition, maybe? Know what's going to happen in the future? Is that a superpower or flying? Certainly flying. That would be great. That's the first time I've heard precog. It's a good one. It's a good one, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would become addicted to it, though. I, I It's a place that I would always be, trying to work out the, the best option, and I'd be so stuck in my own head that I wouldn't be out of it to enjoy the ability of having precog. Um, but Marvel or DC? Well, you know, I'm not a big comics person. Uh, I will go with Marvel just because I like the movies better. I have not traditionally been a big comics person, though. Sci-fi or fantasy, and why? Well, I, these days I would go with science fiction uh, because I think it's more exciting to me. Uh, recently, I've been reading novels by Neil Stevenson and Stephen Baxter, and these are authors who have a real long view and can handle almost geological time frames, which I think is going to be significant going forward for humanity. We need to think far ahead, not just in our immediate vicinity here and where we're going to be and how we're going to get where we need to be. And uh, for instance, Neil Stevenson's novel, Anathem, I thought was just brilliant. That was a novel that was up there with Stranger in a Strange Land or really any of the peak science fiction novels that I had read for the, uh, the, the, just the quantum physics aspect of it, I thought was, was brilliant. Uh, fantasy, I do enjoy fantasy. I went back and tried to read the, uh, the Lord of the Rings again, though, and I couldn't get into it. Um, some stuff I've read, which I guess qualifies for fantasy, would be the uh, Joe Abercrombie stuff, uh, The First Law and uh, Best Served Cold and stuff like that. That's really bordering on sword and sorcery, though, I guess, or really just more like, almost military fantasy set in some kind of medieval fantasy realm. 
So I like them both, but I would go with science fiction. Okay. You know, I, I used to really dig the Dune series a lot, and, and then I just kind of let it go after Children of Dune. Um, but and it just seems to me that, yeah, sci-fi, there, there's, there's a lot more there to benefit people in general. It just gets you in that headspace of what can, what can be done here. It's true. It's so exciting. You know, you get that sense of adventurous expectancy. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it can serve as a, a cautionary tale for what we don't want to have happen. Some of these uh, dystopias that we've read about now seem to be coming to pass in mm -hmm. real life. Oh, well. <laughs> you know, with cyber this, and uh, I don't even know where to begin, but current mm -hmm. events are seeming more and more like a uh, William Gibson novel. Mm -hmm. It's true. So we feel like, you know, at least we feel like we've been down that path before in, in fiction, and maybe we can avoid some missteps in the future. Yeah. You know? now, what happens if I put that down? A little bit more light. It's sunset here. Okay. Well, uh, I it, it's it's going to be sunset here sometime very soon. I would imagine within the next hour or so would put me in about the same time frame that you are now. But uh, Derek, is there anything else that you would like to share with us today? Oh, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, I'd like to say thanks so much to everybody who tuned in. Uh, it's an antiquated way of looking at it, I guess. Everyone who's uh, who Skyped in or however they're here. Uh, yeah. All of my uh, authors and uh, editors, David Schultz and S.D. Josie, of course, first and foremost. Without them, I couldn't do what I do. And without all the readers, I uh, certainly couldn't do what I do without people to buy and read these books. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, and everyone, you have a wonderful evening. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, however, next month, I've got some really exciting uh, exciting people lined up uh, for you. And well, let's see, I'm booking, I'm booking April now. So if, if you would like me to talk to you, please contact me. I'll be here. And uh, thank you for tuning in to Legends Tabletop. You all have a wonderful evening. Thanks. So